this video is a demonstration of our Starbucks earnings model. Please keep in mind that this model was created prior to the fiscal fourth quarter 2015 earnings release and that the values shown will update, so please check our website gutenbergresearch.com for the latest details. The structure of the model is consistent with our other companies. In the upper left hand corner we have our color legend, which indicates anywhere you see a blue cell represents our estimates. Orange cells represent consensus estimates and purple cells represent company guidance. You'll notice that uh, the historic columns are shaded in dark gray, while the future forecasted periods are shaded in light gray. We have a income statement, segment details, below that is a balance sheet, followed by a cash flow statement, multiple valuation section, and a discounted cash flow valuation section. So starting with the income statement, how do we get to these details? Well, the details come from the segments. So if you look, each one of, um, of Starbucks segments is highlighted here, and we'll just look at the America segment first. And you can see that we calculate the net new stores and the total stores for the segment, and then we look to the revenue per store to drive what our total revenue per the segment is. And you can see that management provided some guidance for total stores in Americas for the entire fiscal year of 2015. They estimate will be 600 stores. And so that means in the, the fourth quarter they must be adding 221 stores. Now revenue per store we keep relatively consistent. There are some seasonality effects which we've introduced into our model here. Um, but for the fourth quarter we're expecting revenue per store in the Americas to be at about 200 and 30,000 um, per store. So that gets us to our revenue of 3.4 billion. Now each one of the segments has a similar approach. In fact it's actually identical because it's based on how management has reported their quarterly results in the past. And if we expand all of these you can see that those are that's what's generating the total revenue um, line item up above in the income statement. So you can see total revenue is based on the sum of each one of the segments down below. So we have the Americas, MEA, Channel Development, Asia Pacific, and that gets you to your total revenue. Now to come up with the company operated store, licensed store, and food service and other revenue, we simply apply the same percentage that we've seen in the past. So 79%, 11%, and 10%. And then to get to the cost of goods sold, we're simply taking, um, let's, we're just multiplying it based on a percentage of the total revenue. So down below the segment section, you'll see some ratios. Here we have our gross margin on a gap basis, which we've input at 59% for the next quarter. And that's what's used to calculate the cost of goods sold. Now for the operating expenses, that's calculated a little bit differently. We've got our details down below for each segment, what based on the operating margin for each individual segment is going to be. And so the equation looks pretty cumbersome, but that's essentially what it's doing. It's taking the operating expenses for each one of those segments, um, and then in that case, since it's including the cost of sales, it's, it's backing that piece out and some other corporate charges. Income from equity investees, we're simply taking the four quarter average. That one's a little bit difficult to project, but it doesn't have a significant impact on final results and that gets us to our operating income on a gap basis. Next we have some non-gap adjustments and if you click on this you can see that it's pulling from this summary section down below. We have some amortization of intangibles based on the Starbucks Japan acquisition. <clears throat> so that's at the section below the ratio analysis. You scroll back up to the income statement you can see that that brings us to our operating income on a non-gap basis. 
From that, we have some interest income, which is based on a, um, well, it's based on the average of the prior two quarters. And then we have interest expense, which is based on a percent of the average debt balance. From there, we just apply the effective tax rate to come up with our net income on a non-GAAP basis. And you can see that we've also calculated the net income um, on a GAAP basis as well. And then when you divide the net income by the shares outstanding, you get to your final EPS number. And you can see in this case, the EPS is in line with consensus and in line with management's guidance. So now that we have an understanding of how our valuation model works, you could download this model and then change some of these cells in blue to see what impact it would have on the total share valuation. So for example, if we look here, we, we now the way the model is calibrated, we have a 12-month uh, price target of $54.50. And we say, well, what would happen if our operating margin for the Americas segment went up significantly? And if we just take a look at recent history, what is the highest operating margin? Oh, they're actually operating at the highest margin. So let's take it the other way. Let's say that they go down to... Um, the lowest operating margin that we've seen in the last couple of quarters. So 21.6%. What would happen to earnings and share valuation if we saw a 21.6% op operating margin for the Americas segment next quarter? 21.6. And you can see that the share valuation went down by about 60 cents per share. So if you do that coupled with a decline in each one of the other segments, you could see how how much that would impact shares. We'll undo that for now. If we scroll down to our multiple valuation section, we can talk about how this is calculated. So what we do is we take the daily closing price um, over the last three months, and we subtract from it the net cash per share. And in this case, we actually have net debt per share of 22 cents. And then we did divide that by the next 12 month EPS estimate. And that comes back with our price earnings multiple on a forward basis. Now for Starbucks, we're using our average over that period, but you could use the high or the low and see what the impact on the valuation would be. And then to get to the final value, you can see we are just multiplying that multiple plus the sum of the EPS from the bottom of our income statement over the next four quarters. And we're adding to that the net cash per share. The discounted cash flow evaluation approach is a little bit different. First, we have to calculate our weighted average cost of capital. And then we discount the cash flows over the next five years, which represent our first stage in the discounted cash flow evaluation. And then we add back to that the terminal value, which is based on what our constant growth assumptions are for the company. If you'd like additional details on how our discounted cash flow evaluation approach works, please visit our website, gutenbergresearch.com, or our YouTube channel where we have a video describing it in detail. Thanks for watching.